Hello again and welcome to the Project Pipeline mini-series. I'm Victoria Young and I'm the design team co-chair for NOMA Pittsburgh. I graduated from Carnegie Mellon University with a Bachelor's of Architecture and a double minor in Architectural History and Intelligent Environment. Today the topic I wanted to discuss is climate responsive architecture, namely why do we need architecture that doesn't just benefit people but the environment as well? and how to recognize how different buildings in not just our own country, but around the world have responded to different kinds of climate. So, first of all, why is this important? Why should architecture respond to climate? Why do we need to work directly with the earth instead of against it? According to this graphic from Architecture 2030, the building materials and construction industry is responsible for 11% of global CO2 emissions. And while this doesn't seem like much, we have to remember it takes a lot of energy and CO2 to power our buildings from day to day, such as you know, lighting, cooling, heating, and our electronics. It takes a lot of CO2 emissions to transport people to and from job sites. And industry, which makes up a third of global CO2 emissions, creates the different materials and supplies that architects need to create these buildings and to sustain them from day to day. And all of this combined creates a very harmful effect on our ozone layer, which is responsible for shielding us from the harmful rays of the sun. And here are four other less scary reasons for why architecture should work directly with climate. The first is culture. So before industrialization, black, brown, and indigenous cultures knew how to work directly with the land and the weather that they were living in. Buildings such as the Diné Mosques in Mali have stood for hundreds of years despite being in a very harsh desert environment. The second is recycling. So this is a rain garden in Larmer, Pittsburgh which uses rainwater collected naturally to help create a garden and water a garden for everyone in the neighborhood to enjoy. The third is to save money. Why waste a lot of electricity on lighting and heating a building when you can use sunlight to naturally light and heat a building without having to turn a single light on? And the fourth is health. It's been scientifically proven that people who live around more trees are happier and healthier and have lower depression and anxiety, and have a lower risk of respiratory illnesses. This is a climate map of the United States, and we are right here on this red dot. Pittsburgh is considered continental climate, but because we get so much rain every year, we are considered a humid continental climate. There are three different main qualities of climate responsive architecture. The first is materials. The more natural materials that you can use in a building, the less that you have to rely on industry to create these buildings and the fewer CO2 emissions that you'll generate. Also, these different natural materials can block and grab different parts of the climate to help benefit the people inside, living inside the buildings. The second is form. Why are buildings shaped a certain way? How can this form work directly with the climate and how can it protect the people inside while also getting benefits from the climate during certain times of the year? And the third is plants. As I've said before, plants bring nothing but joy to people and have a lot of health benefits. The first climate that I wanted to talk about is continental, which is our own. Here we have two different examples of houses in Pittsburgh that respond directly to the continental climate that we live in. The first is more modern and the second one is historical. So this is Fisher Arch designed by Eric Fisher in Pittsburgh. This is an architecture firm, but also a personal house for someone. Because there are four seasons in Pittsburgh, it's possible to have different types of gardens to grow crops and flowers and any kind of plants that respond well to the four different seasons. So Eric had created this garden on his rooftop which had generated a microclimate for the wind and the sun. So this is fully exposed to sun which is perfect for allowing plants to grow. 
And also rooftop gardens can help cool a building since the plants absorb so much sun. The second house right here is Evergreen Hamlet, which is in a very secluded suburb in Pittsburgh in the middle of the forest. So in Evergreen Hamlet, you can see that this house has a pitched roof, which allows rain and snow to run off the building. Because this house was, was designed in the 1800s, it's very old and made of wood and very susceptible to rotting. So having this roof right here prevents excess moisture from entering the house and creating mold and damaging the building. Here are four more examples of houses in continental climates. The first house over here, which is the height of Canadian Longhouse and the Ice Hotel, and the second one, which is the Ice Hotel in Sweden, both make use of heavy materials to help keep heat inside of these buildings. So the Haida Longhouse uses heavy timber construction and the Ice Hotel uses heavily packed ice. These two houses down here were designed by indigenous peoples of North America. This house is, the Apache, is an Apache house and this one is a teepee Plains Canadians house. They both have a conical shape to allow precipitation to roll off of them and materials such as mud and dry brush and animal skins to help keep these houses cool and dry during the winter, during the summer months, during the summer and rainier months. Desert climate. It's really important for desert architecture to use materials that retain moisture to help cool this hot and dry air. Both of these buildings, which are the New Century Garden in San Diego, California, and the Adobe Brick House in San Antonio, Texas, both use this special material called adobe, which is a kind of brick that is dried in the sun and made of mud. This brick absorbs a lot of moisture and can help keep an area cool in the extremely hot and dry desert climate. What's special about the New Century Garden in San Diego, California, is that it has an evaporative cooling pool. So what this pool does is that when sunlight hits it, it evaporates and pulls moisture into the air to help cool it down. Here are four more examples of desert architecture. All of them except the traditional Mongolian yurt tents, which are made of animal skins, are made of mud brick. Similar to the teepee in the continental climate, the Mongolian yurt uses animal skin stretched over light timber construction to help keep its residents cool in extreme temperatures and arid climate. As for these three buildings here, which are the Janay Mosque in Mali, the Pueblo Houses in New Mexico, and this house in Burkina Faso, they all use some kind of mud construction. The house in Burkina Faso and the Janay Mosques in Mali both use a special technique called stack ventilation, which is, a, which is a building form that allows heat to escape from this very tall, from holes in the very tall towers and allows cold air to sink underneath and to cool the residents. Temperate climate. Because the temperate climate is so similar to Pittsburgh's cold and humid climate, uh, I have provided a guide for best practices for designing houses for temperate climate, as well as a picture of a rain garden. The best kind of house for a temperate climate is built on an east-west axis, axis with medium colors to allow sunlight to be absorbed into the house. There are southern openings that capture winter sunlight as well as operable windows and awnings to bring summer shade and some summer breezes. In addition, trees that are planted on the southern axis can allow for cooling summer wind to pass through but block out cold winter winds. This rain garden makes best use of the precipitation during, temperate, during the more temperate months such as the spring, summer, and fall. It absorbs excess rainwater and waters these different plants to allow them to grow. These stones and this pond collect the rainwater and give them to the plants. 
And here we have two examples of architecture in temperate climates. This is the Temple of Horyuji in Japan. It's very significant to Japanese culture because it is a Shinto temple, and the Shinto philosophy prioritizes, and the Shinto philosophy prioritizes bonding with nature and using completely natural materials to create buildings. This is made completely of wood without any metal nails. So it's also sustainable and is withstood several centuries of earthquakes in Japan. Its pitched, its pitched roof also allows precipitation to roll off of the building and to keep it dry. This is a pavilion designed by MAD Architects from China. It provides outdoor seating and shade to people who are who want to enjoy a drink or gather outside and also allows for a lot of opportunities for plants to grow not just around the building but on top of the building too. As stated before in the continental climate part these plants can help cool uh, these plants can help cool down a roof by absorbing sunlight. And finally we have the last climate tropical we have the Shotgun House in New Orleans, Louisiana, and the Hobbit House in Waimanolo, Hawaii. Both of these houses have very large patios and porches so that people can gather outside and be protected from the heavy rains and allow cool breezes to filter through. The Shotgun House in New Orleans is especially significant because Having such a large porch would allow a lot of people to gather and get to know one's neighbor, which creates a very unique culture in New Orleans. The Hobbit House is completely surrounded by very tall native plants to Hawaii, such as palm trees or banana trees. And having all of these different trees can allow for summer breezes to filter through and, cool, and naturally cool this area and allow native plant life to flourish. Here are four examples of indigenous and African architecture found in tropical climates. All of them have pitched roofs to allow rain to roll off of them and are made of materials found in their own environments. The Romulus Longhouse, in, the Romulus Longhouse in Malaysia and this traditional Polynesian house are on stilts because during the rainy season, a lot of buildings tend to flood over. So it's very important to elevate a building above the ground to prevent excess rainwater from getting in. Also, they were made of lightweight timber construction to help keep the house cool and allow for proper ventilation. This traditional Haitian house helped to inspire the shotgun houses in Louisiana. It has a large porch and a small awning over here and is completely surrounded by trees to allow for natural shading and cooling. And finally, we have a special Lamu house on the Swahili coast, which is made of seashells found along the coastline and allows for ocean breezes to naturally cool this house um, because it uses lightweight materials such as this thatched roof. And here's a challenge for everyone listening to this lecture. Think about a place in the world that you want to visit, literally any place in the world that interests you. Research the climate and learn about, and, okay. Um, so here's a challenge for everyone listening to this lecture. Where in the world do you want to visit? Pick any kind of location, literally any location. Pick up, look up the climate, look up the climate, and look at the different buildings that are in that climate. And using what you've learned from all the different examples that I've shown you, try to figure out how the architecture of that place that you want to visit responds to the climate and adapts to it. I hope you, and here are some resources for further reading if you're interested. Some of these are books, some of these are websites. And thank you for participating in this lecture. I hope that you learned a lot and I hope that you learned a couple techniques that you can draw on to create climate responsive architecture in the future. Thank you.